Good morning. What a great day. Man, isn't this great summer weather? Yesterday was perfect for that wedding. It was packed. There was over 400 people here. The cars filled every piece of grass out there, uh, space. There was nothing left. So this morning, I just want to share a couple of things with you before we hand off the message that Brian has for us. Uh, number one, uh, there is a baptism coming up, and that is on uh, July 23rd. And uh, baptism um, is an opportunity for you to personally say, you know what, I'm going to make a commitment to follow Jesus. So um, a lot of us were baptized as children. I know I was. And uh, I thanked my parents for taking me to church, for beginning that relationship with God that I have. And I remember the day when I said, you know what, I want to really make this mine, and I'm going to commit my life to Christ to follow him. Uh, and, and I was baptized uh, when I was in my 20s. And then uh, I wasn't sure it stuck, so I, I did it again when I was 30. But uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but anyway, it's a great opportunity if you've never been baptized to say, you know what, I want to make this commitment and I want to make this commitment in front of this church family and these people. And uh, we're going to have a huge tank out here on the 23rd. And uh, I think we've got ice cream, all kinds of fun stuff uh, that we will uh, be doing as well. So that's coming up on the 23rd. But today we have a very special thing that we're going to do. It is a baby dedication Uh, let me read this first verse to you here in Psalms um, 56. It's on the slide. Look, there you go. That I may walk before God in the light of life. Psalms 56, 13. So what is a baby dedication? Well, a baby dedication is the parents and the church committing to raise the child to follow Jesus Christ. When Jesus was born, uh, as he started to get a little older, uh, Mary and Joseph... They took him to the temple, and they dedicated him. Basically, they said, God, we thank you for this child. We, we thank you for the blessing in our life, and we're going to commit to raise him to follow you. And really, that's essentially what a dedication is. So this morning, we have a dedication, uh, the Hamill family, and we're going to dedicate little Oliver. It's not a great name. I first heard his name, I thought, yeah, that's great. That Oliver is an awesome name. So let's have them come up this morning. And, uh, and bring him up, the parents come up, and the grandparents if they'd like to. Wow, he's half grown already. <laughs> so Megan and Levi, and uh, how about the names of, of these here? You want to tell us your name? Arabella. Oh, that, that is an awesome name. And how about your name? Dave Hamill. That is awesome. <laughs> he likes his name, too. You can see that. So let me share a couple of things uh, with you as we uh, go through this. Uh, it says in Jeremiah 1.5, it says, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. This is God speaking. And God said, you know what? I knew you before you even began. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. He's saying to Jeremiah, he says, listen, I knew you before you began. I had a purpose for you before you began. And that's the cool thing with Oliver, too, is that God knew Oliver before he even began. And God has a purpose for Oliver before he even began. Isn't that cool? Uh, this is a great verse. I just love this verse. And, and I love it most because I was an only child. And I told my wife, I said, we have to have like 20 kids. Obviously, we had two. You could see that she was not down with that. But uh, it's a great verse. Uh, Psalm 127, 3, 5, it says, Children are a gift from the Lord. They are reward from Him. Children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hands. Isn't that great? I mean, if you're a guy here, isn't that great? Uh, they're, they're like uh, arrows in a warrior's hand. How joyful is the man whose quiver is full of them. He will not be put to shame when he confronts his accusers at the city gate. He's saying, you know what? He's saying children are a gift. They're an incredible gift, and they come from God. 
So what I'd like to do today is to pray for the Hamels and pray for Oliver, that God would just do incredible things uh, in his life. Wouldn't it be awesome if we came back in a few years and saw what uh, this family is doing, saw what Oliver is doing, and, and just be amazed by the kind of things God is using them to touch other people's lives, to grow his kingdom, to love and serve other people. I think that's an incredible thing. So here's what we do. We always do this if you're new here. I'm going to ask anybody that wants to, to come forward. We'll just gather around here, and that we'll kind of create a circle. And then we're going to pray for them, lay hands on uh, little Oliver, and uh, then we will send them off. So come ahead, anyone would like to. Okay, Brian, you want to open for us? Yep. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your hand over this family. Father, I just pray that as the years go on, that they can focus on you and they can find you in everything, and that they will know that you are the ultimate answer to every question they haven't asked yet. Father, I thank you so much for an amazing gift that is Oliver. And I pray that this family will watch over him and commit him to God daily. Lord, I just thank you for the Hamels, and um, I thank you for what you're doing and have done in their life. God, would you bless them in immense ways? Would you uh, bind their family together in a greater strength than they've ever known? Would you cause them to support and love one another, to always be there for one another? And Lord, would you help us as a church to come alongside them and to help them to be a part of, of raising Oliver to know Jesus uh, and uh, just supporting them in all their ways? God, would you uh, especially just uh, bring about your peace to their home, to their children, uh, in all that they do? Would they be known uh, in, in years to come? Uh, as a family who has loved you, who has committed themselves to you, and uh, who has raised their children uh, in that same way to know Jesus. The greatest gift that we have in this life is to know Jesus. And, and we just ask that you would keep that in the forefront and that we as a church would support and love them and help them in that process. Lord, for Oliver, uh, you have a plan for him that uh, we don't know of at this moment. Uh, it seems like just a few weeks ago that he was born, and yet, God, you tell us that you have known him since the beginning of time. So you've created him, you placed him in, in the, the womb, and uh, you brought him about. We thank you for his health. We thank you for his strength. We thank you for his personality, which is already growing and developing. And we just ask you, Lord, to use him in a mighty way to impact your kingdom and to, to continue to grow uh, the Hamill family. Um, we ask your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Card for you. You bet. Thank you. I don't know if you have any nicknames for him yet, but I mean, Ollie is just the greatest thing ever. <laughs> well, that is a, is a fantastic part of Iron Ridge, and I've, I've loved those ever since we've started doing dedications because it's a great moment for us to come together as a family, as a church, and just acknowledge that God is in control of our lives and God is in control of what we're doing, and that we're willing to stand up for the other families and the other newborns and the other people that are, are, are just living and, and just to, to stand up for those people in our family is just an amazing moment. And I've always, always loved that. And uh, as he cries, I wish you only the best. <laughs> well, we're continuing in our numb series. Last week, we talked about becoming, uh, becoming numb to comparisons and becoming numb to ourselves before that. And this week, I want to look at something that I think actually sums up both of those things, which is a numbness to freedom. And I use that picture on purpose because that is one of, what I think is one of the greatest moments of freedom in cinematic history. Uh, it's just, it's an amazing moment when he escapes from the prison 
If you know it, it's a Shawshank Redemption, if you know what I'm talking about. And he just comes out after having been in there for so long. And he crawled through the muck and the nastiness of the sewer. And he comes out and it's raining and he throws his hands back. And it is freedom. And that moment's amazing because it speaks to all of us. Because we love freedom in our lives. We love those moments. We love to feel that. But you know what? I think sometimes we become numb to the freedom that we've been given. And those moments just seem to be far and few in between. And we lose sight of, of, of freedom. And freedom is something that I think we've all kind of experienced on different levels. And I think over, over the years it changes as to how we experience those. Uh, you know, one of the big moments of freedom is when you hit 21. Actually, after 21, it's just boring. There's no other birthdays. Up to that point, you know, you become a teenager, you get your license, you're able to smoke, you're able to vote. You hit 21, you're finally legal, you can drink, and then nothing. I guess at what, 35, you can become president, so that's something to look forward to. <laughs> but you become 21, it's this amazing moment of freedom. And I won't forget when I turned 21, see now I was a really good guy, I didn't drink until I was 21. I think it was on the threat of death that I would drink beforehand. So I didn't, and I, and I actually did. I didn't drink until I was 21, and I won't forget when I finally turned 21, and as a rite of passage, I took my identification down to the hubba hubba here, and I bought myself a six-pack of uh, Mike's Hard Lemonade. Because I'm 21, and I'm free to do that. But freedom comes with a price, doesn't it? Because those things make you sick. And I never did it again, but I did because I could. And we've all kind of experienced that, right? You know, when you hit 21 and you can finally do it, it doesn't even matter if you like alcohol. You go and buy some just because you can. Because there's this sense of freedom that you get when you hit 21. You may just buy it and then throw it away, but you can say you did it. And that's something that you don't experience at many moments in your life. But at 21, man, you can, you can experience those moments. Another great moment of freedom is when you pack up and you leave your parents' house. That's actually me. <laughs> Headdresses and all. <laughs> I remember when I finally moved out of my parents' house at the young age of 27. <laughs> I had been there too long. I had taken advantage of them too long. But I remember when I moved out, it was a, it was a tough day for me. You know, I'm 27. I'm an adult. I don't cry until I get in the car and drive away. And there's that moment when you finally experience freedom and you move into your house and you're there by yourself and you can do whatever you want. You don't do dishes for three months. <laughs> you stop doing laundry and you just buy new clothes instead because you're free to do that. And freedom is just so awesome. You experience that and then, you know, it kind of fades away because now you realize that you're the one that's got to mow the lawn. You're the one that's got to fix the appliances. You're the one that's got to paint the bills because freedom comes with its price. You become numb to it. What was so great when you first started is now turned into a chore. And you're no longer free and you're not enjoying it like you used to. See, it'd be great if you could move out of your parents' house for a couple months and then move back in. And then do that every three months. Parents are going, no way. But there's a great sense of freedom that you experience in that moment that you don't experience in other places. And you know what? There's, there's liberty freedom. There's a, you know, we just had an Independence Day. And it's, it's a great opportunity to experience our freedom in this country. And we're free to say what we want and do what we want and go where we want and have opinions and tell people that we don't agree with them. We're free to do that. And America just sells that just in an amazing abundance that you're just free to do whatever you choose. And that's great. It is. It's a very good thing. You know, we are blessed to live in a country that allows us to be so free. But even that can lose value over time. We tell our opinions so often that we no longer think of them as a freedom of speech, but instead a freedom to entitlement. And freedom becomes something that doesn't feel as good as it used to when you first had it. Freedom is something that we can so easily become numb to. And when we compare ourselves to other people, when we focus on ourselves too much, we become numb to the freedom in our lives. And we start to lose sight of what freedom really means. Here's a definition of biblically of what freedom means. It's the ability to respond to God fully out of who he created and redeemed you to be. 
Now, in that, there is nothing that says you get to say what you want, you get to do what you want, you get to go where you want. But instead, your freedom in Christ is something that's totally different and allows you to respond to God fully out of who he created and redeemed you to be. Not that you're there right now, but you have the ability to communicate in the way that you are right now, regardless of how you're changing or how your life is changing or how things are changing. Now, see, there's something that I think we all take part in and we may not realize it, and it's this. It's the gospel of sin management. Now, maybe this is the first time you've heard of this term. The gospel of sin management is something where we focus on whether or not we're doing or not doing sins. We start to focus on how our lives can become better if we stop sinning. We start to look at all the things that we do and we say, well, that's not right. If I could just fix that, I'd be a little better off. Maybe because I'm doing this and I'm sinning in this way, maybe that's why I'm not succeeding over here. And we start to become managers of our sin. We start to look at the things we do and say, I'll fix this one. And once I'm done here, I'll move on to the next one because the Bible says that's not a good thing and I'm not supposed to do that. So I'll work on it. I'll get better. And when I've gotten rid of that sin in my life, I can start fixing another one. And then when that one's gone, I can feel better about myself because I'm becoming more like Jesus by getting rid of the sins in my life. That's not a true statement. See, not doing bad stuff is a bad definition of freedom. Freedom isn't just about living a good life and avoiding all the bad things in it. The Bible has a very different view of freedom. Dallas Willard, he's got a great quote. It says this, History has brought us to the point where the Christian message is thought to be essentially concerned only with how to deal with sin with wrongdoing or wrong being and its effects. Life, our actual existence, is not included in what is now presented as the heart of the Christian message, or it is included only marginally. You see, it's gotten to the point now to where we start living the gospel of sin management. We start looking at those things and we go, we have to fix those. We have to be better. If we're better and we do less of them, then God will bless me. And that's not the case. Tim Keller goes on to say it this way, which I think is perfect. He says, religion operates on the principle of I obey, therefore I am accepted by God. But the operating principle of the gospel, the good news, the fact that Jesus came and died for our sins, is I am accepted by God through what Christ has done, therefore I obey. You see the differences there? You obey first, and then you'll be accepted by God. That's how we kind of do that. We say, if we, if, we, if we fix enough sins in our lives, if we obey God well enough, then he will accept me. When in fact, it's the other way around. I'm accepted by God through what Christ has done. Therefore, I obey. And it all stems from viewing the Bible as a rule book. And we see this verse, and we see this chapter, and we see this story, and we think, I just got to be a little less like that guy, and a little more like him. I got to not do these things because it says not to, and then I got to start doing these things because it says that I should. And we start living our lives as if the Bible is just a grand rule book to make our lives better if we accomplish enough of the things it tells us to accomplish. But the interesting thing about the Bible is, it's not a rule book at all. It's a story. It's a story from beginning to end that focuses on God and what he's doing. And when we look at the Bible differently and we realize the Bible is not about how and that it is instead about who, it changes our outlook on how we read it. Because now it's not a rule book. Now it's not just a checkbox here and there. And I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that. And because I'm not doing those things, I'm, I'm living better. That's not what it's about. But instead it's about who. And it's about the redemptive story about who God is in our lives. And his sacrifice of his son for us. And how that can change us if we accept it by the grace of God. And not by what we think we can accomplish by checking off boxes. So I want to give you a picture today. I want to give you a picture of the story of the who in the Bible. 
instead of the how so that we can understand and experience freedom in a way that's totally different than what we've been brought up to believe. And it all starts with Abraham. Abraham, you may know him from the story of when he took his son and he laid him down and he was going to sacrifice his son there because God told him to. And then at the last second, an angel comes and says, no, don't do that. Your faith has been tested and you've been proven to be good because of that, because of your faith. You can probably remember that story. Abraham has been considered the father of nations because from there, we've got the 12 tribes of Judah. We have everything that ever came from Abraham. It's, it's the start right there. And there's an interesting moment when it comes to Abraham where he, he gets a promise from God. He gets a covenant from God. He's given this promise so that in the future, people may understand it. Now, that was about 2,000 years before Jesus came. Okay? So that's where Abraham is. It's about 2,000 years before that. Now, fast forward about 500 years from Abraham, and now you have Moses. You guys following me here? Went from Abraham, 500 years forward, now we're at Moses. About 500 years in, uh, forward from Abraham, we have Moses getting the law. And the law were those big, heavy tablets that he carried down from the mountain. You all remember Charlton Heston doing that? That's where we're at now. So here's Moses. He gets the law. The law has been given to the people, the Ten Commandments, and now we have that, okay? So if we go ahead another 1,400 years, we're at Jesus' time. Jesus comes as an example. He lives his life perfectly so that we may know what it's like to see a life that's lived that way. He lives his life and he's the perfect sacrifice for all of our sins. He lives, he dies on the cross, he's resurrected on the third day. That's the story of Jesus condensed. Okay? So fast forward just a little bit more into the future. And now we have Paul. Paul comes along. He was a murderer of Christians. He was the number one guy to go out and take them out because he was really good at it. He had an encounter with God where it covered his eyes and he couldn't see and he goes into the town and now he can see again. He becomes one of the biggest participants in the creation of the Bible. He wrote almost all of the New Testament. Paul becomes a very important figure. And that's where we're at in the Bible. Okay, you, you with me here? Abraham, about 2,000 years before Jesus, 500 years forward, we see Moses. 1,400 years forward, we see Jesus. Jesus dies, is resurrected. Now we're at Paul. And Paul has this to say. God gave the promises to Abraham and his child. And notice that the scripture doesn't say to his children, as if it meant many descendants. Rather, it says to his child. And that, of course, means Christ. So here, 2, 000, over 2,000 years ago, from when Paul is writing this, Abraham is given a promise to his child, which is prophesying Jesus Christ. Okay, you all on track with me here? I know this is a long story arc here, but it's going somewhere, I promise. It goes on to say this. This is what I am trying to say, Paul says. The agreement God made with Abraham could not be canceled 430 years later when God gave the law to Moses, the Ten Commandments. Abraham was given the promise. Go into the future. Now we've got Moses. He's given the Ten Commandments. And it says the agreement God made with Abraham could not be canceled 430 years later when God gave the law to Moses. God would be breaking his promise. For if the inheritance, which is Jesus could be received by keeping the law, then it would not be the result of accepting God's promise, which is Jesus. Okay? We're all, we're all firing on the same cylinder here. I know this is, this is crazy. It's Sunday morning. It's early. But you all with me here? Okay. All right. Good. I'll take that as a solid yes. So he goes on, he says this, Why then was the law given? Why then did Moses get the Ten Commandments? It was given alongside the promise, which was Jesus, to show people their sins. But the law was designed to last only until the coming of the child, Jesus Christ, who was promised. God gave his law through angels to Moses, who was the mediator between God and the people. Okay, so Jesus hadn't showed up at the time of Abraham or Moses. So instead, at that moment, they were given 
the law so that it could be used alongside to live their lives appropriately with God. It goes on, it says, is there a conflict then between God's law and God's promise? Now you see, you might get that idea because the law was given before Jesus was here and now they both may be in conflict with each other. That may be what you're thinking, but that's not the case. He says, absolutely not. If the law could give us new life, we could be made right with God by obeying it. Okay, so that verse is saying that the law and Jesus Christ work simultaneously with each other. That if you were to do the law, you would be obeying it, and thusly, you would be made right with God by doing that. Okay? So now we have the law, and we have Jesus, and those two things can coexist. And he ends by saying, but the scriptures declare that we are all prisoners of sin. So we receive God's promise of freedom only by believing in Jesus Christ. Let me give you a recap. Abraham, he's given a promise. That promise is that Jesus someday is going to come and he's going to just, he's going to give his life for everybody here. He tells Abraham, this is what's going to happen. 500 years later, Moses comes along. He's given the law. The law helps the people at that time live without a savior because the savior hasn't come yet. Fast forward 1400 years. Jesus comes. The savior comes. He lives his life. He dies. He's resurrected three days later. And he has now fulfilled the promise that Abraham was given. Paul is explaining to us that we need the law to help us understand the sins that are in our lives. But even without it, we receive God's promise of freedom only by believing in Jesus Christ. Our sins be can become too much of a focus and we stop accepting the fact that Jesus gave his life on the cross for us to accept by doing nothing of our own. No amount of sin cleansing in our lives will allow us to enter heaven. Only will we be able to enter heaven when we acknowledge who Jesus Christ is and his sacrifice is, and we receive God's promise of freedom only by believing in Jesus Christ. You see, becoming more like Jesus is called holiness. Becoming more like him is called holiness. Becoming less sinful is a byproduct of becoming holy. We need to change how we look at the things in our lives. We need to realize that we have to focus on who Jesus is and living our lives to be more like him and stop focusing on trying to fix all the sins in our lives because that will ultimately happen when we become more like Jesus. And we come back to the definition again. The ability to respond to God fully out of who he created and redeemed you to be. That means you have sin in your life. You have problems in your life. You have issues in your life that you just can't seem to get over. You know those sins you keep returning to over and over again. You go, why? Why can't I fix this part of my life? Why, why can't I do better than this? It's because, it's because we're looking in the wrong place. It's because we're not focusing on becoming more like Jesus, but instead we're focusing on trying to fix sins. You may have heard the verse in Romans. It says, you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. How can you be set free from sin when it permeates our lives? When we always have those issues, when we always have those struggles, sin seems to always be there. The best day you have is always countered by the bad sin you did the next day. And sin is in our lives and we just, we wish we could fix it and we wish we could take it and throw it away and never have to worry about it again. And it's all because our focus is off. You see, sin is a symptom of our disconnectedness from God. From the moment we're born, because of the first sin, we're disconnected from God. And the only way 
We can have less sin in our lives. We can deal with those issues. We can fight those things. It's not by trying to cure the symptom of sin, but instead focusing on becoming more like Jesus. Because that story arc is, is so important. The fact that the law was given here to, to show us our sins, to show what we're doing wrong. But then Jesus came along and he said, you know what? If you focus on becoming more like me, those things will take care of themselves. You can't cure a disease by focusing on the symptoms, but instead you need to look at the issues from the beginning and fix those. Our problem is not sin. Our problem is disconnectedness from Jesus. And you'll have those things that come. You'll have those things that are just difficult to get past and you just can't seem to fix this part of your life. And you won't because you focus too much on trying to fix that and not focus on being, becoming more like Jesus. That's what's required because becoming more like Jesus is called holiness and being less sinful is a byproduct of being more like him. So do yourself a favor. Experience freedom from sin, not because you've gotten rid of it all, but because you're focusing on being more like Jesus and that sin no longer enslaves you. It's there. You're working on it by becoming more like Jesus Christ. That story in Galatians ends by saying this. For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true, true children of Abraham, the promise. You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham now belongs to you. Not because you're sin free. Not because you got it all figured out. Not because you're working on being a better person. But because you acknowledge that you can't get anywhere in your life unless you become more like Jesus Christ. That's when you'll see things change that's when you'll see those sins in your life become less meaningful and they won't come back to haunt you like so many of them do but instead you'll realize that I'm focusing on Jesus and for that reason that's going to change my life that's going to help me with the sins that's going to help me with the struggles we have a baptism coming up as we talked about a couple times today that is the perfect example. You're acknowledging that you're following Christ. You're acknowledging that he's most important to you and that though sins may come into your life, things and struggles and issues may come into your life, you're not enslaved to them, but instead you're focused on getting your relationship with Jesus right. And when you get that right, a less sinful life is a byproduct of becoming more like Jesus Christ. Let me pray with you this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for a freedom in you that says all I need to do is focus on being more like you and life, even through its struggles, will not enslave me. I thank you for the amazing grace-filled gift that is your son dying on the cross for us, even though we don't deserve it. And I thank you that you are a merciful God and I thank you that through that mercy, we will be allowed to live free from sin and becoming more like you every single day. Father, I thank you for the young ones. I thank you for their part in our church and their part as they grow. That they would know you and that they would know that their life is not marked by sin, but instead is marked by the amazing grace that is your sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen.